As timings go, it was almost eerie. A little over a week ago on September the 18th, we dropped a video about the frozen conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh, an ethnically Armenian enclave within Azerbaijan's internationally recognized borders. In that video, we covered the region's history, the devastating war fought in the 90s, the equally destructive return to conflict in 2020, but we also fretted about how another war might be imminent. That even as we talked up the ongoing peace process, conflict might soon return to the South Caucasus. Sadly, we were more right than we realized. Less than 24 hours after our video went live, Azerbaijan attacked Nagorno-Karabakh. In a lightning assault, they destroyed the region's defenses. Facing total annihilation, the Karabakhis surrendered. The era of Nagorno-Karabakh as a de facto recognized state was over. The question on everyone's lips now is, what happens next? With a history of bad blood between Yerevan and Baku, there are real fears that the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh might lead to ethnic cleansing. Fears, too, that another flashpoint between the two states may already be on the horizon. A flashpoint that could result in all-out war. In today's special update video, we're covering the insane week the South Caucasus has just witnessed. A week that changed the course of history. When the end came, it was swift and it was brutal. After some three decades as a de facto unrecognized state, Nagorno-Karabakh, known to Armenians as the Republic of Artsakh, fell less than 24 hours after the Azeri shelling started. On the morning of September the 19th, 2023, everything had been quiet if tense. Just hours before, Azerbaijan had partially lifted a five-month-old blockade of the region, letting in the first aid trucks in nearly half a year. In Western capitals, nervous experts quietly exhaled. Sure, this was a sign that crisis had been averted. But what they'd mistaken for a new beginning was really just a false dawn, an illusion, masking yet more darkness. Later that same day, around noon, the quiet was broken by the sudden thud of artillery, by the buzz of drones and the flashes of flames. In a high-speed assault, Azeri forces swept into Nagorno-Karabakh. Although up to 100 of Baku's troops would be killed, their sheer force made them unstoppable. Within hours, Armenian villagers had been surrounded. 200 Karabakhi soldiers were dead, along with perhaps tens of civilians. Although the self-declared government of Nagorno-Karabakh issued pleas for help, nobody answered. Despite large protests in Yerevan, Armenia refused to intervene. Meanwhile, the roughly 2,000 Russian peacekeepers, a remnant of the shaky 2020 ceasefire, simply stood aside. By midday, on September the 20th, 2023, the war was over. Facing total annihilation, the enclave surrendered. A Russian brokered peace forced them to lay down their weapons and accept disarmament. In return, the Azeri president, Ilham Aliyev, offered Nagorno-Karabakh's Armenians nothing beyond absorption into Azerbaijan. They would retain undefined language rights, but there would be no constitutional recognition, autonomy, or special treatment. The days of the Republic of Artsakh were over. With them had ended one of the last great frozen conflicts left over from the fall of the Soviet Empire. In the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, that conflict started all the way back in 1988, when both Armenia and Azerbaijan were still part of the creaking USSR. Since we did two full chapters on the history of this conflict in last week's video, we're going to refrain from going through all of the details again right now. Suffice to say, the extremely simplified version is that Nagorno-Karabakh spent the Soviet period as an ethnically Armenian autonomous oblast within the borders of socialist Azerbaijan. In the dying days of the USSR, the Karabakhis tried to break away and join Armenia. Azerbaijan refused to let them go. What followed were a series of pogroms, massacres, and ethnic cleansing carried out by both sides. But it would be Yerevan that in 1994 emerged victorious from the war. At a cost of some 30,000 lives, Armenia had ensured Nagorno-Karabakh would remain forever outside of Baku's control, or so it seemed. In 2020, after a quarter century of fragile peace, the situation abruptly reversed. Now rich off of oil money and backed by rising regional power Turkey, Azerbaijan launched a surprise offensive that devastated Armenia's forces. Over 44 days of fighting, Baku reclaimed 75% of all territory it lost in the 90s. Two years later, in 2022, an additional two days of conflict saw the Azeris take strategically significant heights overlooking the now wounded enclave. Now, it's important to note that at this point, Nagorno Karabakh wasn't considered part of Armenia. Even Yerevan allies called it an unrecognized state within Azerbaijan's internationally recognized borders. But what sounds like a technical point had real-world consequences when Baku decided to blockade the enclave. Since the blockade was technically taking place on Azeri soil, none of Armenia's allies, not Russia, not Iran, not the collective West, felt able to intervene. The result? 
By September this year, nagorno karabakh citizens had run out of food and medicine. Electricity and water were barely functioning. Famine was on the horizon. Although the US, EU, and Russia all separately tried to sponsor diplomatic solutions, they get nowhere. On September 19, 2023, Baku announced an anti-terror operation, allegedly in response to landmines killing Azeri soldiers. Really, though, it seems that President Ilham Aliyev had sensed this was his chance to strike when his enemies were starving and weak. It was a cold calculation that would bring the autocrat a swift victory, but it was also one that would have ramifications for the wider world. Right now, the most important aspect of this story is the fate of Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh. What will happen to them once Azerbaijan fully takes control of their home? It's a vital question, and one that we are going to be analyzing later. But before we get into that, we want to take a quick detour to examine how the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh will be felt all around the globe. Because make no mistake here, some powerful players are invested in this small slice of mountainous territory, and Baku's victory is likely to have an outsized impact on their fortunes. In the case of the collective West, that impact is likely to be negative. To be blunt, the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh represents a humiliating failure for EU and US-led diplomacy. Immediately prior to the September 19th assault, European diplomats were briefing that their peace process with Armenia and Azerbaijan was working. Baku had promised not to use force against Nagorno-Karabakh, and Western officials had believed them. The Azeri attack put paid to any notions that Baku still gives a crap what the EU and the US think. German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock was reduced to complaining in the United Nations that, quote, Baku again assured that it would refrain from using force, but this promise was broken. Partly, this is because international norms are breaking down everywhere. Partly, though, it's also because President Aliyev knows that he has massive leverage, and that's in the form of natural gas. After Moscow turned off the taps to Europe last year as punishment for supporting Ukraine, Europeans were left scrabbling to find alternatives. While officials managed to make sure their citizens didn't freeze, they only did so by acquiring gas from new sources with no questions asked. One of those sources just happened to be Azerbaijan, and now Aliyev clearly thinks Brussels is too dependent on him to punish his assault on Nagorno-Karabakh. Embarrassing as this debacle has been for the West, though, it's also been a nightmare for one of the West's greatest foes, Russia. Now, if you follow Russian media, and God help you if you do, this might seem a strange claim. After all, Putin's various propaganda arms have spent the last week crowing about how this is all Armenia's fault for getting too cozy with the United States. But make no mistake, while it may not be as immediately humiliating as the West's failure, Azerbaijan's defeat of Nagorno-Karabakh is a clear sign of Moscow's waning power. Armenia, you see, is meant to be one of Russia's closest allies, a member of the CSTO, Moscow's equivalent of NATO, and the Eurasian Economic Union. As recently as 2020, that alliance saw Vladimir Putin publicly state that the Armenian Karabakhis were under his protection, that refugees from the 2020 war could return to the enclave and be sure Russian peacekeepers would keep them safe. Three years later, those same peacekeepers simply stood aside as Azeri forces swept in, stood aside even as Baku's troops killed serving Russian soldiers. During the assault, at least six Russian peacekeepers are reported to have died, including Colonel Ivan Coven, the deputy commander of Russia's North Fleet submarine forces, killed when Azerbaijan's troops opened fire on his car. Although Baku later apologized, members of the Russian Duma have accused Azerbaijan of deliberately targeting Russian peacekeepers. Against such a dark background, the Kremlin's new cozy relationship with Azerbaijan seems less like Putin playing four-dimensional chess and more like a distracted autocrat trying to keep on the good side of whoever is winning. As The Guardian's defense analyst put it, quote, Moscow's post-Soviet strategy has often been to stoke conflicts to weaken its near neighbors, creating crises in Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. But on this occasion, the Kremlin has had to adapt to Azerbaijan's rising power. Yet it's not just the West and Russia that have been burned by Baku's victory. It's time to turn our attention to the nation that will likely suffer the greatest instability of all, Armenia. Now, if you were to pick one word to describe the mood in Armenian society right now, it'd probably be betrayed. Betrayed not just by Moscow's failure to protect the Karabakhis, nor by the wider world's inaction in the face of Baku's assaults, but rather betrayed by their own leaders. In the 1990s Nagorno-Karabakh War and the conflict in 2020, Armenia was an active participant. Even during the two-day conflict of 2022, Armenian soldiers fought and died to protect the exclave. In 2023, though, the government simply stood back 
and let events unfold. On September the 19th, Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan announced that Yerevan would not join the fighting, that it was up to the Russian peacekeepers to protect Karabakh Armenians. Naturally, this stance was about as popular as the US Congress renaming President's Day Benedict Arnold Appreciation Day. Yerevan was filled with protesters calling for Pashinyan's resignation, so many that riot police had to disperse them with stun grenades. Ever since, smaller protests have continued to block traffic and disrupt daily life. As public anger grows, Pashinyan has responded by claiming that so-called high-level circles in Nagorno-Karabakh are planning riots to topple his government. While a governmental collapse currently does look unlikely, although not impossible, there's no doubt that plenty of ordinary Armenians are pissed off. And that means the country could be entering a period of increased instability. More than just a slice of territory, Nagorno-Karabakh has important emotional resonance for many Armenians. Losing the 2020 war with Baki was a bruising experience. Letting the territory go down without even putting up a fight? Well, that's just devastating. Speaking of Vox, independent researcher Melek Set Panosian predicted the emotional shock of Azerbaijan's victory might push the public in a more nationalistic, militaristic direction, a push that could destabilize the region for a long time to come. This will be doubly true if another major power in the conflict gets its way. Turkey. As Azerbaijan's main backer, Ankara is the war's biggest winner outside Baku. But Turkey's greater geopolitical goals don't stop with the Azeris occupying Nagorno-Karabakh. Rather, they involve Azerbaijan's own exclave, Nakhchivan. Just as Nagorno-Karabakh was separated from Armenia by internationally recognized Azeri territory, so too is Nakhchivan separated from the Azeri mothership by parts of Armenia. If you imagine Armenia looking like a badly drawn tree scratched by an untalented child, with the wide, leafy north tapering to a wobbly looking trunk in the south, then the trunk is the part separating Azerbaijan from Nakhchivan, a 40 kilometer swathe of Armenia that borders Iran. Well, Ankara and Baku both want to cut that tree down, or at least build a road and rail line across it, thereby joining Nakhchivan and Azerbaijan into a single entity. Known as the Zhang Azur Corridor, this proposed land bridge would receive the arrangement that existed in Soviet times, joining Baku with the 460,000 Azeris outside its main territory. More important for Ankara, it would properly connect Turkey to its ally. Right now, the only part of Azerbaijan Turkey borders is Nakhchivan. That means any goods Ankara wants to ship to Central Asia have to go through regional rival Iran. Complete the Zangazur Corridor, and Turkey will have a road and rail connection not just to the rest of Azerbaijan, but the rest of the Turkic world. The trouble is, such a corridor would be anathema to Armenia. Not only would it undermine Yerevan's territorial integrity, but it would also effectively close the border with one of Armenia's only regional allies, Iran. As Armenia's foreign minister recently told the UN, forcefully imposing on Armenia an extraterritorial corridor, a corridor that will pass through the territory of Armenia but will be out of our control, is unacceptable to us. Yet writing on Twitter, journalist and Caucasus expert Thomas Duval noted that forcing the Zangazur corridor on Armenia while it's weak is exactly what Ankara and Baku are likely to do. This was seemingly confirmed by a Reuters report on September the 25th that Aliyev and Erdogan met to discuss the corridor, a pet project of Aliyev's for some years now. Back in 2021, the Azeri autocrat threatened to create the corridor to quote, whether Armenia likes it or not. Perhaps it's no surprise. Armenian telegram channels are currently alive with speculation that another invasion is on its way. That the fall of Nagorno-Karabakh was just step one of a broader plan that will see Azeri and Turkish forces try to carve a trail through Armenia's south. Now, before we get on to the chances of a wider war, though, we do need to touch on something far more pressing, something that could become the world's next great humanitarian crisis, the current fate of Nagorno-Karabakh's ethnic Armenians. Listen to President Aliyev talk about his plans for Nagorno-Karabakh, and you'd be thinking wondering what all the fuss was about. Aliyev has promised to turn the region into a paradise, saying his government will give the Karabakh Armenians rights and security. His foreign minister agreed, saying ethnic Armenians in Azerbaijan will enjoy, quote, all rights and freedoms. Indeed, there are even some tentative signs that Baku wants to demonstrate kindness towards its new citizens. On September the 26th, regional expert Lawrence Broers reported on Twitter that one of the key things that airy diplomats discussed with the self-declared government was the setting up of field hospitals to care for the war's wounded. But while the rhetoric might be encouraging, the reality on the ground is somewhat less so. 
Rather than a tale of integration and paradise, the story coming out of Armenia right now is one of panicked flight, exodus, and deep-seated fears of ethnic cleansing. Here are the known facts at time of writing on September the 26th. On Sunday night into Monday morning, Azerbaijan finally lifted its blockade, allowing the free movement of Karabakhi Armenians out of the enclave and into Armenia itself. By 5 a.m. local time, nearly 3,000 refugees had fled across the border. By midday Monday, that number had more than doubled. By mid-afternoon Tuesday, it had grown to over 19,000 people, with more streaming across every single minute. The Armenian town of Goris is being overwhelmed. By the time you see this, that 19,000 figure will have undoubtedly grown, perhaps overwhelmingly so. Speaking to Reuters, David Babayan, an advisor to Nagorno-Karabakh's president, declared that rather than come under Azeri rule, quote, 99.9% .9 of us prefer to leave our historic lands. Exactly how many refugees this could equate to is unknown. Officially, the number of ethnic Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh is 120,000. Unofficially, many admit the number is lower. At its most extreme, it could be as low as 50,000. Still, 50,000 refugees is a significant amount for a country like Armenia with a population of just 2.7 million. So far, the government reports that it has the capacity to take in only 40,000. If the official figure of 120,000 Karabakhi Armenians turns out to be correct, then Armenian society is about to be overwhelmed. As to why so many are fleeing, well, we only need to look at the recent past. During the First Nagorno-Karabakh War from 1988 to 1994, ethnic cleansing became commonplace. Armenians fled Azeri pogroms. Azeris fled Armenian massacres. By the war's end, Armenia had seized control of seven Azeri majority districts surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh, sending hundreds of thousands of Azeris into exile. Ever since, Baku's forces have been desperate to return the favor. As Lawrence Brewers told Politico, we have this history that when Azeri soldiers have come across Armenian civilians who have stayed in place and not fled, they have been murdered. We saw this in 2016. We saw this in 2020. There's a climate of impunity. To this, we can add the U.S. State Department report following the two-day 2022 war, which recounted not only, quote, extrajudicial killings, torture, and other ill treatment, but also the desecration of Armenian graves by Azerbaijan soldiers. Given all of this, it's perhaps not surprising that Nagorno-Karabakh's residents are running to the safety of Armenia. After all, President Aliyev, for all of his fine words today, recently called Karabakhi leaders blood-sucking leeches. Exactly the sort of dehumanizing language used during the ethnic cleansing campaigns of the Balkan Wars. All of which finally leads us to a question that is as simple as it is loaded with danger. What happens next? Caucasus specialist Thomas Duvall is one of the most prolific, knowledgeable writers on the region. So when he tells the BBC there's a real and credible threat of ethnic cleansing, it pays to listen. The group this expert seems to be most worried about? Nagorno-Karabakh's males. As a small, self-declared state within an extremely hostile neighbor, Nagorno-Karabakh operates its army on a conscription system. Most of its young men are under arms, while most of its older men are former soldiers who have in the past fought against Azerbaijan. Speaking to the BBC, Duval highlighted the potential for Baku to allow women and children safe passage, but to detain or outright kill men it considers enemy soldiers. To be fair, Azerbaijan has offered an amnesty for fighters who lay down their weapons. However, Azeri officials have specifically said it will not be backdated. And it's known Baku's leadership has lists of Karabakhi Armenians it believes were responsible for war crimes in the previous conflicts. That means the majority of the older male population could be targeted, especially since Russia's peacekeepers seem disinclined to do any actual peacekeeping. Thankfully, there are no signs yet of a systematic campaign of death, and the wall ultimately concluded that Azerbaijan cares too much about its international image to conduct mass murder. Still, the fact remains that this is, as of the time of recording, an incredibly tense situation, one in which the best outcome is an orderly exodus, and the worst is bloodletting on an epic scale. And that's just at a localized level. If we zoom out further, it becomes clear there's a chance for things to get really out of hand. The first point of worry is the Zangazur Corridor that we talked about earlier, the one which will cut through Armenia's extreme south, sealing off its border with Iran. Already, there are signs that Ankara is pushing Baku for this to be the next step, a sign that a Yerevan is bound to refuse. 
That leaves Azerbaijan the option of creating the corridor through force. And while Nikol Pashinyan's government could survive sitting out an assault on Nagorno-Karabakh, there is no way Yerevan could do anything but fight back if Azeri forces tried to seize parts of Armenia. Again, we need to be clear here that there's no suggestion another invasion is imminent. But if Ankara and Baku lean too hard on the Zangazur corridor, then it could become a future flashpoint, one that would make last week's war look trifling in comparison. That's because Iran is unlikely to accept an Azeri land bridge that would cut it off from its ally Armenia. Given relations between Baku and Tehran are already at a low at this point, there are understandable concerns that an attempt to create the corridor could lead to a wider regional war, one in which the combatants aren't just Armenia and Azerbaijan, but also including Turkey and Iran. Another potential point of worry is the growing rift between Armenia and Russia. On the 24th of September, Pashinyan went on TV to criticize Moscow for abandoning the Karabakhi Armenians and suggesting that Armenia would need to find new ways to protect itself outside of its alliance with Russia. To which Russia responded with a press release full of anti-Armenian rhetoric and veiled threats. As Lawrence Burroughs described it on Twitter, Russia has issued an extraordinary statement itemizing its grievances against Nikol Pashinyan in ways that many take to threaten Armenia's sovereignty. A break with Russia would leave Yerevan in an extremely tricky place. Right now, the Armenian city of Gyumri hosts a vast Russian base, one that acts both as a security guarantee, but also a warning for Yerevan not to stray too far from Moscow. Nor does Armenia have alternative allies that it can turn to. Despite Pashinyan's western pivot, there's little to no chance of Yerevan ever joining the EU or NATO. Nor is it easy to imagine the US coming to the aid of a country allied with one of its staunchest enemies, Iran. In short, it seems like Armenia is today a vulnerable place, bordered by two adversaries that want more of its territory under the protection of an unreliable partner that may favor its enemies. In such circumstances, it's easy to see how things could erupt in violence. After all, they already have. So as we close today's video, it's with the future of the South Caucasus region still in flux, with the fate of Armenia and the ethnic Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh still uncertain. Geopolitical games are being played that we can't even begin to guess at. What is certain, though, is that after 35 long years, the fate of Nagorno-Karabakh has finally been settled. A holdover, unrecognized state from the Soviet Union's collapse, at last erased. A chapter in South Caucasus history closed for good. What comes next remains a mystery. But there's no doubt that the world should be paying very close attention to what unfolds amid this stark, mountain landscape in the coming weeks. Because as we've already seen, what happens in the Caucasus can have consequences for the entire world. Consequences that for better or for worse will soon become clear to us all.